So now my wife and I prepare for a new administration and uh, for a new baby. Thank you. If you want to call the Kennedys royalty, John was the crown prince. He had an effect on two, maybe three generations of America. He was America's son. John Fitzgerald Kennedy Jr. He was one of the most famous men of his time. John, 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 John. He was also one of the most eligible bachelors in the world. His charm and good looks melted hearts. The answers to the most frequently asked personal questions are yes, no, we're merely good friends, maybe someday, but not in New Jersey. But that all changed the day this American prince found his princess, Carolyn Bissett. I could tell this was different. This was deeper, more mature. What he really loved about her was her edginess. She pushed back, which was good for him. This way, Carolyn. Carolyn. But the more obsessed the world became with the couple, the more determined they were to do things their way. On September 21st, 1996, John F. Kennedy Jr. and Carolyn Bissett were married in a secret ceremony hidden away from the eyes of the world. It was videotaped by his best friend, Billy Noonan. Here, here. Now, more than two decades later, Billy is releasing this lost footage for the world to see for the very first time as we celebrate the love of America's royal couple who were taken far too soon. Second. Roll one, take one. If it's okay, I would love to show you some of Billy's video. Okay, this is our first time seeing this. Yes. Oh, that's incredible. Here we go. You guys ready for all of this? You better believe it. I'm so excited. Nothing like arriving by truck to your wedding, right? <laughs> Just after John was born, and it's gonna be short, John. <laughs> A great little turn. Yeah, it's dynamite. This was a secret ceremony. No, run. Run like the wind. <laughs> Everyone knew about it afterwards, but nobody has watched it. This is amazing. Uh, Tyler changed my life in a way that I never thought was possible, and uh, just made me tonight the happiest man alive. To step back in time. John and Carolyn sitting in. <laughs> to celebrate an American love story. Hi, John. It's you, Carolyn. My love for it. And to witness the legendary Camelot wedding <laughs> that the world never got to see. What I'm feeling about this video is that if you want a perfect example of their love, this is it. It's Thursday, September 19th, 1996. John F. Kennedy Jr. has revealed to his closest friends that he's going to marry his fiance, Carolyn Bissett, in secret. And he's asked them to meet him at the Teterboro Airport to board a private jet. Here we are at Millionaire. The jet for Florida. And over here, and at Many of these guests were given only day's notice, and not one of them has a clue where they're headed or where this wedding will take place. Da -da -da, hey, Spanky! Huh? <laughs> so that's John in Teterboro, and we knew there was a wedding, but we didn't know when or where. It was almost like they were, um, they were eloping, and they brought their nearest and dearest with them. That's what it felt like. Anthony, you all set now? Long before the days of smartphones and high-definition cameras, Billy is capturing the events on an early 1990s handheld camcorder, which he brought along at John's request. You know, John and I have been close friends for 25 years. And he had given me the camera for my bachelor party. Come on, Billy, get there. Come on, Billy. And it sort of became talisman or a uh, mascot. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have the right to be here. Documenting these milestones in our friends' lives. 
So he said to me, you still have that videotape we gave you? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, bring it down. So I brought it down there, not knowing what I'm doing. If I were a videographer, it never would have looked like that. It was like, uh, you know, haphazard. It's light, it's dark, it's the audio's not right. But it plays into the whole thing of the weekend was that nothing was scripted. As Billy continues to document the events, he, like the rest of John's friends, still has no idea where they're headed. I said, is it in the United States? And he said, yes. And when I got on the plane, it just said destination Florida. Here we go. And I said, so we're going to Florida. And it was like, well, we're not really going to Florida. And I was like, well, where are we going? The whole thing was so surreal, but we all trusted John because he was pulling off uh, quite a coup. But to understand the reasons behind all this secrecy, we first have to go back to the very beginning. John F. Kennedy is elected as the 35th president of the United States. It is the climax of one of the closest, most dramatic elections in American history. So now uh, my wife and I prepare for a new administration and uh, for a new baby. Thank you. <laughs> On November 25th, 1960, John Fitzgerald Kennedy Jr. was born to the newly elected president and first lady of the United States. Not sure you could ever duplicate his life. I mean, he was born into Secret Service protection, grew up in the White House. His father was the most powerful man in the world at one of the most delicate times in modern history. As the only son of this young and charismatic new leader, he immediately captured the hearts of the nation. I remember the pictures under the desk in the Oval Office. I mean, who ever saw anything like that? John Jr.'s family would quickly become idolized by the nation. The Kennedys really gave this sort of aspirational glamour. It was the dawn of the 1960s, and people were really looking towards the future and felt sort of invincible almost. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The Kennedys were really a symbol of that. They were this young family and a beautiful wife, handsome husband, and they had two adorable children, and it just was this picture of American perfection. There was something about them that had that quality that you often get with royalty. Tragically, this American fairy tale would be cut short. Something has happened in the motorcade. Stand by, please. On November 22nd, 1963, this little boy would lose his father. President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. Exactly three years after John Jr. entered the world, he would bid his father one final farewell. A gentle reminder from his mother, and John John celebrates his third birthday with a soldier's farewell to his father. And this little boy's stoic salute would forever bond him to the hearts and minds of the nation. He was one of us, because what we saw in him was we saw ourselves. We saw our own humanity. And that is sort of the magic of John Kennedy Jr. After President Kennedy's death, Jackie was left to raise two children by herself. Jacqueline Kennedy, of course she was beautiful, of course she had incredible personal style, she was well educated, but I think probably her most important role is being a great mother. You know, these children grew up under the spotlight, but she did as much as anything to protect her children, to make them as normal and as genuine as possible. It is rather hard with children. There's so little privacy. I don't mind for myself, but I think it's very hard with them. How can I bring up normal children if they can't be treated that way? She was, of course, super strong because she had been through so much. And that was something that John had a tremendous amount of respect for. She gave him self-worth, self-esteem, self-confidence, but humility too. She was a very centered and very cool woman. And when she was mad at him, she got mad at him. When he did something right, she complimented him, like any parent should, instructing their children to be good kids. 
And in spite of all the attention that they had to go through, they grew up abnormally normal. John and I bonded quite quickly because we're both new students in 11th grade. Neither one of us knew anybody else, and we spent a lot of time for that reason. We were put in the same classes, and we just became buddies. We both had a very similar sense of humor, sense of play. You know, we had some fun over the course of his life, evading paparazzi and sneaking around and jumping over shrubbery and hiding. Oh my God, yeah. I mean, he had such a sense of mischief. The stuff that we used to do, the gags that we played on each other. I mean, the trouble that he would start. But he could always get himself out of it. And he said it was more fun getting out of it than actually getting into it. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> When I met John, he was kind of uh, a little awkward, a little clumsy, a little not, you know, so slick. <laughs> but then he grew up, really grew up in the world. He started to realize that he's just like this kind of gorgeous, like full-grown man now. I knew John when he was an awkward teenager, and he morphed into this sort of, you know, stud most sexiest man alive. Once John came of age, he went from a nation's son... Thank you. Thank you very much. ...to the world's obsession. He didn't know how to handle it. He didn't want to handle it. He was embarrassed by it. The answers to the most frequently asked personal questions are, yes, no, we're merely good friends. Honest, she's my cousin from Rhode Island. I've worn both, maybe someday, but not in New Jersey. You know, I knew John and had hung around him quite a bit. And walking into any place in New York with John Kennedy it was like walking into heaven with God. That's how huge he was. Someone told me that at one point he was the most recognized male face on earth. Dating girls was not difficult for John, which I found, you know, infinitely annoying, but. Uh, he had had relationships with, like, adoring high school girls. And then when he got out of college, then the models, the ones that were popping up on the covers of magazines back in the 80s. We'd all seen John with the Madonnas and a lot of women that were outstandingly beautiful. Yeah, women just loved him. He was beautiful and he had all of these wonderful qualities. John was funny. Sports car, two <laughs> girls. <laughs> hey, yo, dude. He had an open nature, which was warm. He's got the looks, he's got the money, and he's got a great future. He could be the next president. A romantic at heart, this most eligible of bachelors secretly yearned for something more. And he would find just that, in a beautiful, brilliant young woman named Carolyn Bissett. Growing up the youngest of three sisters in Greenwich, Connecticut, Carolyn's early life was shaped in large part by her mother. Carolyn's parents divorced when she was young. And I think she was very heavily influenced by the fact that her mom got on with her life. You know, that, that her mom wasn't ruined by the divorce was important to her. I think it was a family trait in the Bissettes that you weren't a shrinking violet. And she was very self-confident. But young Carolyn was defined not only by her strength, but also by her charisma and effortless charm. In high school, she was well-liked and, you know, very beautiful and, you know, stylish. She was always the most popular person in the room. Upon graduating high school in 1983, Carolyn enrolled at Boston University and soon discovered the first love of her life, fashion. Not long after graduation, she would get her first big break. She was working at a local Calvin Klein store in Boston, and one of the executives noticed her and said, oh my gosh, she is gorgeous and confident and has her own personal style. That more minimal chic look, which was really the look of the brand. So Calvin Klein wanted to kind of harness that and said, come to New York, work in our store here on Madison Avenue. If you were in the fashion world in New York City, it's where the sexy people were. New York City in the early 90s was incredible. And Calvin Klein was an icon in fashion. He was the first designer to bring in really modern, sleek, elegant looks in America. 
Carolyn's talent, style, and savvy quickly shot her to the top of New York's fashion scene. Pretty soon she found herself really being kind of an elite stylist to people like Diane Sawyer and Annette Benning. Before long, she was a Calvin Klein executive working side by side with the man himself. After we do the music, and then we'll tell them how to roll. And at a quite young age, she was making a six-figure salary, living that, you know, fashion dream in New York City. But as much as she impressed in her professional life, it was her personal side that truly captivated. My agent called me and said there's a job at Calvin Klein. So she connected me with uh, the booker at Calvin Klein at the time, which was Carolyn. And I met her, and she hired me, and we became friends. She was just a great person to work with and had great style and great taste. But I think what really drew me to Carolyn was that she was so kind. She wasn't narcissistic, she wasn't egotistical, she was very friendly and very open. She was just a person that you, when you sat and talked to, she made you feel like you were the most important person in the world. As Carolyn's star rose in the world of fashion, it would soon cross with the man who would change her life forever. There are numerous reports about how they first met. There's one account of how both were running in Central Park and he was suddenly taken aback by her beauty. No, his friend Billy Way introduced them. I, I don't know. I tried to stay away from it in my book because everybody I talked to had a different story. There's another account about a friend of hers and his going suit shopping. Yeah, that sounds possible. The jogging in the park thing, no. <laughs> but it definitely is true that John swept her off her feet very early on in their relationship. Carolyn was used to guys who were more closed and she had to draw out. John was not that kind of person. If John was interested in you, he was very open and very forthcoming. And she found that to be very refreshing. First time I met Carolyn, she was in the kitchen at the president's house in Hyannisport. I remember she didn't come from the privilege that he did. And what he really loved about her was her edginess. You know, she was real. She wasn't gonna pretend. She was who she was, and she pushed back, which was good for him. We need a little kick in the butt, and she gave it to him. Before long, the two were inseparable. And it quickly became clear that America's prince had finally found his soulmate. I could tell this was different. This was sort of deeper, more mature, and we were all for it. You know how relationships, sometimes it's very clear that you're, they're balancing things out. Carolyn did that for John. She helped the parts of John that needed to be nurtured, I thought, in a great way. Carolyn not only nurtured John personally, but she became one of his greatest advocates professionally as well. Ladies and gentlemen, meet George. There were a lot of people who, when they heard that John Kennedy Jr. was starting a popular magazine about politics, said, what is he doing? And you look back now, you think he saw a moment that not everybody else did. And Carolyn, she knew that John was passionate about it. She wanted to help. She thought about covers. She thought about photographers. She thought about designers. Carolyn was really supportive of George. And we all kind of thought, well, this, this is interesting. Something's going on here. This is not just a girlfriend. She was a pretty big catch. And he knew that he had to be everything that he needed to be, or she might find somebody else. And, you know, he sort of stepped up his game. On 4th of July weekend, 1995, after having dated seriously for more than a year, John whisked Carolyn away to his family's house on Martha's Vineyard, and it was here that he asked her to be his wife. What said the way that John proposed was that they went out later in the day. He says, you know, I love to fish, but fishing is better with a partner. And I think that really speaks to the fact that he knew Carolyn well and knew she wouldn't want something, you know, crazy and attention-grabbing. But to John's great surprise, she hesitated and didn't say yes. It was a big decision for her to marry John because she knew what she would be giving up. And it was a lot. All right, look out, make way. Now make way, let him through, let him through. The media in New York City in the 90s was focused on John. Whenever John did something in New York, every paper had to have that story. Move the bike, move the bike. When he met Carolyn, it became more intense because now you start to see, wow, we're putting together the pictures of the future princess of America. So the media was on overdrive. 
He says she's supposed to me. Maybe she foresaw that once the city knew it was official, everything that they were going to do from that point on was going to be magnified. But eventually what she came to was that that doesn't have anything to do with me. And that doesn't have anything to do with John. We are in and of ourselves an entity that has nothing to do with that. Despite her hesitation and concerns about life in the public eye, Carolyn couldn't deny that John was her soulmate. And three weeks after their weekend in Martha's Vineyard, she accepted his proposal. Ultimately, she said yes because she loved him. And she accepted who John was. And she was ready to be that person at his side. But if their life were to be a public one, John was determined to give his new fiance the private wedding of her dreams. And that meant away from the prying eyes of the world. They wanted an intimate gathering with loved ones around them. They wanted something that really felt real to them. This was John's gift to her. We're going to get married, and there are not going to be any photographers there. There's not going to be any paparazzi there. There's not going to be any fans there. I I'm going to find a way that this day is not going to be ruined. What better wedding present could he give her than finding a way to marry her in secret? Holding a private wedding for America's most followed and celebrated couple would take a level of planning and secrecy unlike any wedding in American history. As John F. Kennedy Jr. and his closest friends touch down at Jacksonville Airport, they have no idea what is in store for them next. It's Thursday, September 19, 1996. John F. Kennedy Jr. and a group of his closest friends are driving north from Jacksonville, Florida, heading towards the Georgia state line. Though John's friends know they're going to a wedding, where exactly this wedding will take place is still a complete mystery. The whole thing was sort of covert because we were doing it, you know, in the darkness. After roughly 40 minutes, they arrive in the town of St. Mary's. Here, they will board a modest fishing vessel converted into a ferry boat. You kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at that. The ferry was like what we would call a, like a lobster boat around here. It was pumped up. It had a diesel engine in it. We were like, what the? <laughs> There's a head on the ferry, I'm sure. No, there isn't. Huh? I wish that <laughs> What next? The size and capacity of this small boat might seem unusual for a Kennedy wedding, but for this Kennedy wedding, it's exactly right. You guys ready? Yep. You better believe it. To avoid any possible exposure, John and Carolyn were forced to keep the guest list incredibly short. No small feat for someone with a family like John's. I mean, imagine if you're getting married, right? It's hard enough. Oh my gosh, do we have to invite my second cousin from Nebraska? Well, imagine if you're John F. Kennedy Jr. That list of people that theoretically you should invite would probably be 5,000 people. It was an incredibly thoughtful process for JFK Jr. and Carolyn. JFK Jr. ended up picking a cousin from each faction of the family. It was kind of one of Bobby Kennedy's family, one of the Shrivers, one of the Radzibles, and kind of just representatives of each of those arms of the family tree. All right, here we go. At just past 9 p.m., this small group of wedding guests set out on the final leg of their journey. And we were driving into darkness. And everybody was sort of holding their breath because now where we're going is about to become apparent. Okay, Roger. And you come around the corner and the guy says, well, we're here. I'm like, we're here? Where? Yeah, I'll go with you. I'll let you know how it is up there. There you go. So all of a sudden, it's like this house in the darkness with these little twinkling lights. The whole thing was so surreal. As the sun rises the next morning, the guests awaken, and this mysterious wedding location finally fully reveals itself. 
They're on a small Atlantic island, one mile off the coast of Georgia, called Cumberland Island. Having vacationed over the years at the island's only hotel, the Greyfield Inn, John knew this remote location would be the perfect hideaway for the wedding. With 36,000 acres of untouched forests and beaches, it's home to over 150 feral horses, less than 50 permanent residents, and a rugged, unpaved main road. Cumberland Island was incredible. I've never experienced anything like that. Seeing the moss and the trees. You felt like you were moving through kind of alleys of trees on that island with the dirt roads. And the water was warm. And it was kind of bath water feeling, not quite that hot, but it was really pleasant. It was a really nice place. Mm. There it is. Oh, unbelievable. It felt like you were there, it was the turn of the last century. There's no cars, there's no bikes. So you're sort of walking, and you know, all of a sudden it's like, oh, look at the horses. There's nothing to compare it to. There were armadillos running around, there were wild pigs. Yeah, you got a big old butt. <laughs> it's hot, no air conditioning. There's very little power on the island. Hey. How you guys doing down here? I mean, can you believe this? This is what we came to. Uh, it was like crazy. As the guests continue to discover the wild and rustic Cumberland Island, the staff behind the scenes are dealing with their own discovery as they learn for the first time who this secret wedding is actually for. Jody Sadowski was hired by the Kennedys based on a recommendation from that year's James Beard Award winner and local restaurant owner, Elizabeth Terry. It was very sketchy. I think it was it's something about it was a wedding um, and I knew I'd be cooking for like three days, but I had never even heard of Cumberland Island before I had been there. Almost as soon as I got off the boat, it became clear. Something was special. This was a different deal. There were two guys who, you know, wanted to know what I had in a bag, <laughs> you know? And I'm thinking, what's it to you, dude, <laughs> you know? Then I see, you know, the little squirrely things come out of their ears, and they were, they were big fellas. So I knew that that was obviously security. And then I started seeing people like Ted Kennedy walking around, Caroline Kennedy walking around. I was like, wait a minute here, <laughs> wait, wait a minute. And then uh, one of the ladies who was washing dishes said, yeah, this is a, this is a JFK Jr.'s wedding. I mean, I, I got goosebumps. As soon as I got unpacked, that's when I was given a special card, and I was told to keep that on my person at all times. It was a card, and it had an Indian head penny and a buffalo head nickel, and you had to present it, and you had to tell the password to get in there. I, I wonder if anybody has saved any of these. Now, the coins are somewhat rare, I'm certain, so you're not gonna fool anybody by just putting a Jefferson nickel and any old Lincoln penny on a card. I thought that was quite brilliant. And if you were on the premises and were caught without this on your person, you probably would've got frog marched out of there. At that time in 1996, I was writing the, the newsletter and I would do the, all the programs for the, the church I was attending at the time. And um, I wrote a nice little editor's corner editorial on my experience for the rest of the congregation to enjoy. And, uh, and that would be this. All right, editor's corner by Jody Sadowski. Cumberland Island is nice. The island is also very isolated. Maybe that's why JFK Jr. and his new bride, Carolyn Bissett Kennedy, chose this particular area for their wedding. You may have heard through the grapevine that I was involved in some aspect of the wedding festivities. The rumors are true. I was responsible for the production of all consumables. The work was very hard, the pressure virtually unbearable, but this was an experience. I surely... <laughs> We'll never forget. As day turns to night on Cumberland Island and all of the guests have finally arrived, the first wedding event of the weekend gets underway. 
in this never-before-seen lost footage. Guests gather on the 19th century veranda of the Greyfield Inn, sipping from an assortment of wine and cocktails as they toast the couple-to-be. This is so fantastic that you have this. And to just have family and close friends, it is natural, it is real. There are a few things that have gone. Well, there I am. I remember just enjoying it so much, that dinner. They could both relax with the people that they were used to relaxing with because it was such a small group of people. You know, I, I loved John's family. They were funny. There was a lot of humor. And uh, I know that uh, organizing a, a wedding, a Kennedy wedding, is uh, not like invading Iraq. It seems that way. And, uh, we, we, we understand it. But most of all, we want to thank this rehearsal dinner just shows how much their guests were there for them. And that's what the weekend was about. It was about them. That's really special. I want to say for all the Kennedys, we're very proud of all the Kennedys. <laughs> <laughs> we have shown something that is very special, and that is that we can keep <laughs> As the rehearsal dinner for John F. Kennedy Jr. and Carolyn Bessette continues into the night, Senator Ted Kennedy leads the toast to the bride and groom in lost footage seen here for the very first time. Most of all, we want to thank Freeman Bessette for their generosity and hospitality. We want to just say that you're not only gaining John as a son-in-law, but you're gaining 75 Kennedy. <laughs> We promise that we'll only visit you if you survive some death. And not tell us It's great. I love it. love seeing it. I loved that speech. Teddy was John's, like, you know, his closest father figure, really. He was the patriarch. You know, he was the youngest surviving brother whose brothers died at an early age. So but he was able to uh, connect with John on a deeper, more personal level. But also, John's mother had passed away. So he was the only adult there from uh, John's family. Going through the magnificent forest and down the magnificent beach reminded so much of Cape Cod. And we know how much my brother and Jackie would have appreciated this very special spot that was close to the sea, was close to the dunes, close to the sand. And you can feel the wind the spray, things which they, they value so highly. So we know why they love this very, very special place. This came to me this morning. I was at home uh, trying to get an airplane ticket to come down here. By the way, no seven day advance, no 14 day advance, <laughs> no 21 day. <laughs> I, I do want to say that um, John, uh, in many ways, was and is uh, my best friend for many, many years, and we had the most time together as kids. Yeah, so that's Tim Shriver, who's one of uh, my closest friends and uh, John's first cousin, one of John's closest friends. You know, those two were together uh, from the very beginning. You know, they were brothers. And Timmy is the, uh, he's the purest soul uh, that I know. Uh, my, I have a little son, four years old, and he has for a year ridden his training wheels bike. And today he was out there this morning, and the training wheels were off, and he was riding his bike. And I think in some ways marriage is sort of a taking off of the wheels. 
and I thought of that image, uh, John and Carolyn, when I saw him this morning, and uh, I hope for you that tremendous, tremendous happiness of now having the wheels off and uh, riding off together uh, on a wonderful, wonderful adventure. So cheers to both of you. and. Uh, May I say a few words? Yeah. Alan and I owe all of you uh, a great debt of gratitude. Uh, I realize that we impose certain conditions upon this event, and uh, they may have at times seemed extreme, uh, but what was really important for us was to be able to have a collection of people who we really love to make our lives uh, interesting and meaningful and, and, and give, give both of us and our relationship going forward a sense of uh, connection with the people in our lives and our families who really matter. So many people have gone through great uh, efforts one way or another. Timmy, who I waited until the seventh day, uh, had to have called him deliberately. <laughs> I just love seeing these kind of private moments because um, they're embarking on life together. And I don't care if you're a Kennedy, I don't care if you're a Sweeney living in West Virginia. We all have a beginning of life with our loved one, and this is it. It's very similar. You sit around people who love you, you toast each other and say things about each other. So this is like everybody else's life. But the, the thing I loved about John and Carolyn was that's what they were like in general. But everybody here, and there's uh, too many to mention, has, has just really extended themselves in ways for this, besides just keeping it quiet, that has meant the world to us. And we are so happy that you all could be here and so grateful for you all for doing it. I just want to say that I look forward as we go to having all of you as integral parts of our life together. I look forward to getting to know Callum's family uh, more. Uh, it still yes. sticks in my craw today. She's going to be called my wife on Sunday. Who is that? That's a good one. How perfect. <laughs> he has no clue. <laughs> He screws up what day of the week he was supposed to get married. I mean, that's this is perfect John. That's why everyone's laughing. He's laughing at himself. You know, he was just absent-minded about some things. Do you ever notice the, the, the wallet chained? I mean, he had to tie his wallet to his pants so he wouldn't forget it. He was so forgetful that at my wedding, he shows up and I said, by the way, where's the blue blazer? He goes, oh, I forgot my blue blazer. Oh, yeah, yeah, no problem, John. All you had to do was bring a blue blazer. Uh, Alan changed my life in a way that I never thought was possible, and uh, just made me tonight the happiest man alive. Here, here. Here, here. You know, he said that this was him creating a family of friends. You know, that sums it all up. John wasn't always wearing his heart on his sleeve, and that night he was. So after dinner, we're all feeling pretty good. We just wanted to eat, drink, and have fun. Isn't that what our good guests are supposed to do? As night fades and the sun rises on Cumberland Island, the day of the ceremony is finally here. Hey, Noonan. I'm a member of the Massachusetts State Police. We were here to do a sobriety test. Oh, God. Please bail. <laughs> Everything that they did was over the top, right? So after dinner, we had a bonfire down on the beach, which, you know, were 20 boxes of cigars, 100 different bottles of cognac, almanac, sealed. I mean, it was like it was like a, a, like a smuggler. His ship had crashed and landed on the beach. It was like, you know, these are gorgeous French cognacs. So I thought, you know, tonight I'm going to get myself in a little trouble. So I stayed too long down at the beach. What time did you get in the morning, what Billy? Me, yeah. <laughs> and unbeknownst to me, John came into my room 
and picked up the camera, and I was like, shut that thing off, I'm in bed. It's still ball busting, right up to the altar. Wait, there's a little blinking thing with a, with a cross to it. Caroline, I miss you already. <laughs> Save me a dance, will you? How do I turn it off? Wait, Count, I'm gonna go with you. See ya. After the rehearsal dinner on Friday night, uh, John got all the guys together and uh, gave us these boxes, custom-made boxes, to keep our usher gifts, which were customized boxers. As you see, these are mine with John's initials and my initials on them. What else is in the box? Well, let's see. So when we came into the um, African Baptist Church, there was a Bible and a fan. Those were the gifts that you had. The fan was to keep you cool, but these Bibles were all there, and it's a, uh, and it says, uh, a special guest, John and Carolyn, September the 21st, 1996. And uh, I've kept this ever since. Uh, reminds me of that. And again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty good remember when, you know? Can't go wrong with the Bible, right? It's 4 p.m. Finally, the time has come. All the efforts to keep this wedding a secret and evade the press have been leading up to this. Guests eagerly await the moment they will watch the happy couple say their I do's. Unbeknownst to the guests, the little church is seven miles away on a dirt road, and their transportation... Uh -huh. Oh, look at that. <laughs> ...pickup trucks. <laughs> This is incredible. I mean, they're being shuttled to the ceremony in the back of a pickup truck. That's crazy. <laughs> yep, yep. Oh, look at that. Into the sunlight of the spirit. Guests pile in and travel down bumpy dirt roads in search of the secret destination. This is incredible. <laughs> Nothing like arriving by truck to your wedding, right? <laughs> Wow, it is so remote. And these people are out in the jungle. This is really unbelievable. My God, could you imagine? The fact that this was the Kennedys and Jeeps through the far, it just, the extents that reporters and paparazzi and photographers would, would have gone through to get this is unimaginable today. You can see in the passenger seat is Senator Kennedy and his wife Vicky is in the middle. But the thing that's so funny is that there's like 17th century Chippendale chairs from the dining room in the back seat of this Chevy truck. I mean, can you believe this? As guests travel down the beach, suddenly an ominous sound. You kidding me? Oh. All of a sudden, there was like some helicopters came around and they were, they were like hovering and we were all like, oh God. If the press were to discover the location of the ceremony, the wedding would be bombarded by the media and everything John and Carolyn had worked so hard to achieve would be ruined. When we first saw those helicopters, we knew that you're gonna have a problem. You kidding me? Oh. My initial reaction would probably be like, who told? How did this get out? <laughs> you ruin everything. It's got to piss him off. Because if you're John, you're thinking, who might have said something? Because up to that point, it was Mission Impossible. They'd done it. They pulled it off. And you know, I've seen the paparazzi behave appallingly. And obviously, whoever got a picture of this weekend would have been a coup for them. So the whole idea was to keep everybody off of the island. So the only way they knew what to do was to fly a helicopter to try to get some pictures. You gotta understand, John and Carolyn getting married, it is the biggest story in America. So every paper had to have the story. That's how important John and Carolyn were. You're probably petrified. You know, so much of the operative of this planning of the wedding was around the guise of secrecy. So just imagine that you, all of a sudden you think that your entire plan is foiled. If the helicopter was to find the location of the ceremony, more would follow. 
and the private wedding that John worked so hard to give Carolyn will be ruined. Everybody wanted to lose them, so we took off and had to basically evade them by blasting into the trees, making it possible to make it kind of a trick route and losing them. And then all of a sudden, they weren't there anymore. <laughs> it was a miracle. <laughs> in addition to the guests, those involved in putting on the wedding are also on their way to the church. Among them is David R. Davis, the gospel singer who will sing for John and Carolyn. We were huddling the van this size of 15 passengers, but it was full of people. And I remember uh, Carolyn Bissett's family, her mom and the sisters were in the van with me. They were talking the whole time, and it was excitement, you know. It was 1996. I was 40 years old, and I was minister of music at my church. And uh, I came home to my mom's house one night, and she came out, and, you know, and she was saying, some lady's trying to get in touch with you. And the messages over there on that answering machines, you know, they had the little cassette tapes back then. So I called her and she said, we have a friend that's getting married and they need a gospel singer for the wedding and you, your name has come up. And I said, oh, I don't do that. I said, I sit behind the piano and play beautiful piano accompaniment for powerful singers. So I just said, no. Then she told me to humor her and she just said, sing something. And I don't know what I sang, but she said, yes, yes, you're the one, you're the one. It's like, but, you know, I'm not even finished yet, you know. And I was like, I'm not going to do it. I didn't get hired to sing at weddings. That was just it. But she was very persistent. And she was nice. So I guess that's why I finally I opened my mouth to say no. And yes came out. Well, I'd say the road has smoothed out a lot over 23 years. Back then, the road had deep ruts in it. Everybody got a, well, at least one good bump. Now that's Sorry, more like it. Our whole ride was the like that. <laughs> Just like that. David arrived on Cumberland Island earlier that morning so that he could meet with John and Carolyn privately to discuss the music. When I first got there, I went in the back, and John and Carolyn were just sitting there. He said, so what you, what you got for us? What you going to sing for us? You know, and I had gone out of my norm to prepare something here and now and you and I. And he said, that's nice. But do you know Amazing Grace? Whoa. I was like, yeah, I know Amazing Grace. Oh, yeah, we want that. You know, he wanted, as it were, spirituals. Amazing Grace is a hymn and a spiritual. And then Senator Kennedy came and talked to me and he had heard how I tried to get out of doing this wedding. He said, I know you think you're not supposed to be here, but. We wanted somebody here that knows about the things of God. And I knew by the divine providence of God is the reason that I was there. So for the first time, I was consciously glad that I did not win the fight to not do the wedding. Ah, here we go. steps had rotted away. So they were building steps and somebody was sweeping it out, the doors were open, so we went straight to the cornerstone. First African Baptist Church founded in 1893 by Reverend T. Lockett. I knew that, you know, black folk had built it, slaves. And I felt the spirits of my ancestors back here. I dare say that when the wedding took place, they were the first people to come back here since, you know, the last people went away from here. Does so it? cool looking, yeah. It's a great little church. Yeah, it's dynamite. We got there and it was like this really touching, really beautiful, teeny little wooden chapel. So beautiful in there. Does so it? So cool looking, yeah. So it was a sort of sacred feeling. Very nice, quiet feeling. And it wasn't artifice. 
It was very, very special. I remember being told that it was built for slaves, and I'm sure that that was a really important part of their decision. It's so um, imbued with meaning. That's, that's his family, boy. I think perhaps for my family, one of my father's proudest legacies is his association with civil rights and for his work in I learned in my early teenage years what his father stood for, what his father meant to the work of Dr. King, and not only his father, but his father's brother, the Attorney General. Because that challenge is one we are unwilling to postpone and one we intend to win. You know, most of the major decisions that John would make in his life would become symbolic of some cause that he was advancing, and that's what he was doing. As the guests gather outside the church, it quickly becomes clear that things are far from ready. It was a whole operation. They were opening up a church that had been closed for decades. I mean, the white paint was still on the windows. Mrs. Onassis's butler, who now worked for John, is out planting plants and putting up ivy. And I mean, we were getting there for the service was supposed to start in 15 minutes, and they hadn't even swept out the church yet. And of course, you know, John was late. We've spent an hour and a half at the church. It's hot and we're thirsty. We're all slapping our legs from these chiggers. They gave us fans, which were no friggin' help at all because it was so sticky. And our shirts are soaked through, wringing wet. I don't want to be doing this anymore. All of a sudden, a guy shows up from out of nowhere with a case of ice cold Heineken. Hey. <laughs> We're like, what the? <laughs> what, no shrimp? You know, I mean, it was like, where did this guy come from? Yeah, take that bottle up. Oh, here he comes. Yeah. Here he comes. And then who showed up? Well, there he is. No, man. Run. <laughs> Run like the wind. Hey. So now it was like, come on, we got to go. But as the groom prepares to take his place, the wedding party quickly realizes that the bride is still nowhere to be seen. People were kind of wondering if everything's okay, because it did go on, I think it was a couple hours maybe. More than two hours past the planned start time, new concerns arise. The sun is just setting. It's the last rays of daylight. And this church is gonna get really dark. There's no, clearly there's no electricity. With its windows completely painted over and daylight fading, the possibility of even having a ceremony in this church is now being called into question. I mean, if she doesn't get here, well, you got a problem then. John F. Kennedy Jr. and Carolyn Bissett are about to say I do on George's rustic and isolated Cumberland Island. But as the sun begins to set, the bride is still nowhere in sight. Kind of wondering if everything's okay, because it was a pretty long wait. <laughs> the ceremony is to be held in a small 19th century church, which has no electricity and is getting darker by the second. How many weddings do you go to that happen in the dark that you really can't see what's going on at night? Finally, after nearly two hours, the bride appears. I was so relieved, like, oh, great. I assumed that it was just the nerves that human beings have right before they're gonna get married. But then I heard that there was a wedding dress emergency. So the bride is, you know, getting ready for the most important day of her life. She has this beautiful custom-made slip dress wedding gown. It is being problematic. It didn't have a zipper in the back because it was custom made to her body. It was meant to go over the head like a slip. When something incredibly beautiful is presented and it looks like it was simple, it's just not simple. To design this dress, Carolyn turned to an old friend from her years at Calvin Klein, Cuban-born Narciso Rodriguez. 
Carolyn admired his work and she told him, someday you're gonna dress me. I know you're gonna be a big star. And she was right. In fact, once the dress was revealed to the world, Narciso Rodriguez became a superstar. His dress was iconic and it was brilliant and it was beautiful, but at the time it was completely different from any other wedding dress during the 90s that we had seen. During that decade, we saw a lot of ball gowns and princessy type of pieces. And yet here's Carolyn Bissett. She's essentially becoming America's princess and she doesn't choose something out of a, a fairy tale movie. Instead, she chose something that was elegant and structured. You know, it had a cowl neck, which is a very soft kind of Grecian feature, cut on the bias, skims the body, moves with it, very sexy. It was a kind of a shocking dress for the day. I mean, most people weren't comfortable wearing a slip dress to a function, let alone a wedding. The veil and the gloves were made out of tulle, which is, of course, a very transparent, lightweight material, which made it very magical. Can we talk about the back of the dress too, that it has kind of this open back, which is a tasteful cleavage when you do back cleavage. The simple clean design led to Carolyn having trouble getting it on. So supposedly Carolyn wasn't able to completely get the dress on over her head. Just imagine you being the bride, trying to put on this piece that you had worked so diligently on and suddenly it's not fitting over your head. Thankfully, a quick thinking friend came up with a solution. By draping a silk scarf over her head and across her shoulders, they were able to slide the dress down her body. They had to redo the hair and makeup. Long story short, she was two hours late for the ceremony. By this time, the sun is going down. Happy accident, though, because that is what sparked the idea for the candlelit ceremony. We found some religious candles in there on the altar. They lit some candles, and it worked. And that gave a very sacred, quiet feel to it. And it was so beautiful. That's what made it really timeless. It was really cool. This is so fantastic that you have this. I, I'm, I mean, I'm blown away. Now, with the church glowing in candlelight and the guests in their seats, the ceremony can finally begin. As the sun sets on George's Cumberland Island, Carolyn Bissett prepares to say I do to America's Prince, John F. Kennedy Jr. To see her, I was like, wow. I remember just being awed. Now, for the first time, the world will witness this historical moment as the lost footage of Camelot's secret wedding is finally revealed. We were all together in the darkness. Davis, R. Davis was standing in the corner. Right over here, right about here, right about here. Well, I just started singing, okay, this is it, it's now or never. Amazing race. How sweet the sound was blind, but now I see a grave that taught my heart to The little lanterns were on the floor. And they were illuminating, but not faces. It got magical. celebration of love and of sanctity and of commitment. And so we begin as always in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
God, you have made the bond of marriage the church. Hear our prayers for John and Carolyn. I think seeing her getting married, the joy and the excitement kind of overshadowed everything. I didn't think about doing her hair. I didn't think about what we had done. With faith in you, I just thought she looked happy and she looked beautiful. My beloved. Back in that time, honestly, I can't think of anybody else whose marriage was really more important than this. This was America's royal couple. And so, in the presence of God's church, I ask you to state your intention. John and Carolyn, have you come here freely and without reservation to give yourselves to each other in marriage? We yeah. have. Will you love and honor each other as man and wife for the rest of your lives? Since it is your intention to enter into marriage, I now ask you to join your right hands and declare your consent before God and his church. When I was filming it, I think the candlelight when she's saying her wedding vows really captures the majesty of her and how beautiful she was. I, John, take you, Carolyn, from my lawful wife. I, John, take you, Carolyn, from my lawful wife. To have and to hold, to have and to hold, from this day forward, from this day forward, for better, for worse, better, for worse, for richer, for poor, for richer. Declared your consent before the church. Oh, just, you know, she was so young. She was like a little girl. What God has joined, no one must divide. Carolyn, take this ring. I could see, you know, I knew he was a little nervous. I knew he was a little scared. <laughs> That moment right there, the moment that she put her hand on his shoulder to reassure him that everything was okay, that is quite a loving subtlety. But that was her, you know, she'd be like, oh, John. <laughs> that he's lifted the veil and husband kisses his wife, he turns around and looks directly at me as if to say, did you get that? I'm telling you the love that was surrounding this affair from my viewpoint. And you just felt that family, that familial thing that day. And it was about the love. 
They were married. It was done. It was a triumph. At the end of it, everybody's high-fiving. It's like, we did it. It got done. It may not have been exactly the way. We had to adjust. We had to adapt. We had to do some other things. But it's done. And we're married. The party can begin. Against all odds, John F. Kennedy Jr. has married his soulmate, Carolyn Bissett Kennedy. In a private ceremony away from the eyes of the world. Now, with the ceremony finished, it's time for festivities to begin. And then when it was over, it was like, come on, we gotta go, we're late, we're behind schedule. And we jump in the back of these pickup trucks. Now the sun is set. We were going down the beach, and all of a sudden, this storm comes in from nowhere. And the lightning was up above the clouds. And then there was just a little bit of rain. It was kind of like it was being blessed. It was being acknowledged, and it was being blessed. They were married. It was done. There were no more helicopters. Nobody was there. I was so happy for John, having just pulled it off, and everybody was there, and everything was good. Yeah, it was great. It was a great time. As quickly as the storm had come, the clouds cleared. As the guests continue on towards the reception that will be held on the grounds of the Greyfield Inn, Chef Jody Sadowski has been racing against the clock in anticipation of their arrival. If you've ever worked in a halfway decent kitchen, there's always stress. It's always high tension, high pressure. I didn't get a menu until Saturday morning. And I knew that we were assembling massive amounts of, of, of food. But it, the whole ball game changed when I got in the kitchen. There was nobody in there, nothing was on. The guy who was supposed to get that kitchen prepped had been detained somewhere for some other reason. I'm not quite sure. Maybe he was caught without his nickel and penny. <laughs> Nevertheless, we were behind schedule. So at that point, I had to light a fire in that kitchen. So I got everything cranked up, everything pulled out, food tempered, mise en place set. Before long, Jody and his team hit their stride. And though they had to move quickly to get everything ready by the time the guests returned, in the end, the Kennedy reception menu was as simple and elegant as the rest of the affair. We had the free-range capons, simply roasted. We poached artichokes in a court bouillon with a very simple vinaigrette over top. We had a patty pan squash, and we poached those and sautéed them, which was, which was really good. And finally, uh, Irish potatoes. Why am I not surprised the Kennedys served Irish potatoes? <laughs> it was a challenge, but we got it done, and, and you know, at the end of the whole thing, it turned out turned out very nice. As the guests return from the church, an intimate outdoor reception gets underway on the grounds of the Greyfield Inn. We got back to the reception, and it was a tent that had been set up. Very cool. There's only four or five tables, kind of like a picnic with delicious food. That was really cool. My brother and Jackie, they understood something that uh, my mother and father understood so well, and that is that the real test of a human life is how your children turn out. And what a sense of joy both of them would have for John and Carol. Caroline. When celebrities are out and about, the one thing they try to guard all the time is their emotions. However, it's footage like this that shows the real people. And when you see it, it is so humanizing and so relative to any family. Just after John was born, the ambassador from Ireland came to the White House Ambassador McKernan, and it's going to be short, John. <laughs> at the time, he read a poem that had been written about his son when his son was born. He mentioned these lines to my brother, Jack. 
We wish to the new child a heart that can be beguiled by a flower, a heart that can recognize without aid of the eyes the gifts that life holds for the wise. And when the storms breaks for him, may the trees shake for him their blossoms down. In the night that he is troubled, may a friend wait for him so that his time be doubled. And at the end of all the loving and love, may the man above give him a crown. And after that, my brother was quiet for a few moments and said, I wish that had been written about me. <laughs> well, the fact is, it was really written about John and Carolyn. And uh, I ask you to raise the boss to Kathy Jackie and John and Carolyn. Here you are. That's the beauty of Senator Kennedy, the patriarch, the adult Kennedy in the room, reminding everybody that there's something greater going on here, and it's love. John and Carolyn sitting in the room. <laughs> and First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes the baby and the baby. <laughs> famous you are, the more you cherish the friends that are there for you and support you. It was just a group of friends that were kind of isolated in a place celebrating the love that two people had for each other. They wanted something that really felt real to them. The bride the It was really beautiful because they just wanted to dance together. It wasn't an exhibition. It was something that really had, you know, meaning. This is why people go to weddings, because their love story is just beginning. Only good things from here on in. That's what everybody in the room wants. That's what you expect. John used to ask me all the time, but how did you know that Phil was the one? You know, how did, how did you know that? And then I just remember saying to him, well, how do, how do you know this is the one? He was like, yeah, I don't know, but I know. And I was like, yeah, that's it. Come on, we'll take the baby over, come on. This is wonderful. When we leave the next morning, the whole feeling of all of us, it was great. It was like, we did it. Thank you. Thank you. Here we go. But as the last of the guests depart and the magical weekend comes to a close, the country is about to discover that their Prince Charming is a bachelor no more. It was only when we were getting into the Jacksonville airport, the news was just coming out that they had gotten married. John F. Kennedy Jr. confirmed today that he indeed married Carolyn Bissett over the weekend. The couple managed to outfox and evade the entire tabloid press, who never got wind of the wedding until it was over. I heard, for example, that it was in a small chapel. We still have not heard a word yet. They're still not talking. How do they keep this a secret? I bet you they are just high-fiving on the plane <laughs> or wherever they are in their honeymoon. 
I remember thinking, how the hell did they do this? Because if you could catch us with our pants down, I'm impressed. With just one photo released to the world, the media became desperate for more. And when John and Carolyn returned from their honeymoon, they were greeted by a media intensity unlike anything they could have imagined. No one knows the sense of being hunted until you've had to deal with the paparazzi. Carolyn, where are you going, huh? You guys going for a walk? You picking something up? Come here, wait. During the courtship stage, it was all intrusive, but people did keep a certain perimeter around John and Carolyn. But once they got married, I can't describe how much more it amped up. Hey, John, Carolyn, how's it feel to be married in the section stand line? It was unbelievable. John, Carolyn, come on, John, come on, give us a shot. He says he has the Carolyn, in particular, was shell shocked by the media onslaught. John was sympathetic to Carolyn's concerns about paparazzi because he had been living that life since the age of three, and he knew how to control it. Carolyn was very different, and in many ways, John began trying to find a way to protect Carolyn. Hi, hey John. How was that? John? John? Good. Um, you'll just indulge me for a moment. Uh, you, uh, Bring my wife down and we're gonna go visit with some folks. Uh, I just asked if, you know, getting married is a, a big adjustment. And for her, who was a private citizen up until about two weeks ago, it's even more so. So I just asked um, any, you know, privacy. And, Guys, uh, can you back up on me? Give her if she makes Please. that adjustment. Go back up. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. It was like their love story was just beginning. But the press's love story, it wasn't a love story anymore. It was a very invasive, gotta have this, backstabbing. Even though they loved John, they went to every length to get anything on them. How was the honeymoon, John? Hold oh, it, please. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. Nice and tea. We're not getting it. We're not getting it, John. Are there any little Johns on the way? John, we're not getting it. Can you back up and look this way, Carolyn? Are there look this way, John? John, whoa, whoa. One more time, how was the honeymoon, John? Great. Great, I recommend them. Little John's on the way. Little John. Good luck, Carolyn. Good luck, Carolyn. Good luck, As much attention as she and John got before they got married, it went to a totally different level after they got married. And Carolyn did not always handle that well. The press freaked her out. I think that when the publishing world was looking for her to become her mother-in-law, who she never met, was unfair to her. Jackie would have been able to help her so much in navigating the terrain around Kennedy culture. Jackie had a lot of animosity toward photographers and paparazzi when she first started out as a Kennedy wife, but she figured out how to exist in New York with the paparazzi and just go about her life looking gorgeous and not caring. And so I think that it's a shame because Jackie would have been very, very helpful. The photographs that ran of Carolyn typically looked unhappy, maybe a little pissed off, guarded. And to be fair, I think that there was some very careful photo editing that was contributed to that image of her because if you really want to sell newspapers, you create the good guy and you create this person who's making him unhappy. Like there's an economic incentive to portray Carolyn as filled with drama and tension. And tabloids are not high-minded places, right? Like they're all about making money at the end of the day. But for those who knew her best, the real Carolyn was far different than the one the media portrayed to the world. In the press, the image that I saw of her didn't correspond to what she was like in real life. She was extremely warm and children loved her. And that's something that, you know, I always think of that as a real like litmus test. And my children both, I mean, to say that they loved her is not even enough. 
As she had that real natural warmth, she loved animals, you know. She was alive to nature, and it didn't really come off out there in the world exactly. It wasn't easy, but one thing about Carolyn Bissett is that she was a very, very strong person, and eventually she realized she really sort of had to get used to the idea of dealing with the press and the media. And I, I think it's to her great credit that she did. I do remember her dealing with it. And ultimately, she was actually smiling, and there was a playfulness between the two of them in public, which suggested to me that she was getting better at it. But, you know, we, I mean, life is just so bizarre, of the kind of things that can happen. We have a, um, a developing story. It's hard to tell what to make of it at this point, but uh, we're going to learn a little bit more about it right now. Jody, NBC News has learned that a small plane being piloted by John F. Kennedy Jr. has been reported missing. On July 16, 1999, John F. Kennedy Jr. and Carolyn Bissett, along with her sister, Lauren Bissett, took off in a small plane out of Fairfield, New Jersey, to attend the wedding of his cousin, Rory Kennedy, in Martha's Vineyard. Oh, look at that. Though the flight may have began in the same celebratory spirit as the plane that departed three years earlier for JFK Jr.'s own wedding. It ended in tragedy. John F. Kennedy Jr. was flying from New Jersey with his wife Carolyn and her sister Lauren Friday evening. His single-engine plane never made it to Martha's Vineyard. The Saturday morning, I got a phone call from a television anchor, and she said, John's plane is missing. As the search continues, I want to express our family's support and offer our prayers and those of all Americans. My initial reaction was just, oh my God, this can't be. At 11.30 p.m., the break, the camera finds the fuselage and the body of John F. Kennedy Jr. Later, the bodies of the Bassett sisters found as well. Nobody ever expected that three years later we'd be in another church for another reason. We had to go through the, the, the agony of, you know, we all had to go through our, our loss in our own ways really bad. It seemed like a nightmare. I was just um, heartbroken. Just before the accident, I had gone to John's home for that 4th of July weekend, and I had such strong imprints of my conversations with John, especially one night when I was out on the dunes. I remember deciding to work on a painting of the dunes for John. I wanted to give it to him. And um, when he died quite soon after that, that painting has a special, you know, emotional content for me because, you know, I had to get through it and give it some kind of, you know, give it a, give it its due, actually make a real effort while I was that um, heartbroken. And I actually call it For John on the back. So I always felt like, okay, I got through that, I did that for you. Can't give it to you, but did it. Thousands of mourners from all over place flowers, handwritten letters, and candles outside of John and Carolyn's apartment. I remember the cover of The New Yorker was the Statue of Liberty with a black veil over her. I mean, you, you, you couldn't nail it more perfectly than that's the way we felt. We were headed to someplace beautiful, it felt like. And I think that's the biggest hurt. We lost out on two people who were going to have a, an effect on the world in a much more positive way than many people we look at now. 
Family members watched from the stern of the ship while three urns were opened on the bow. The ocean wind scattered the ashes of John Jr., his wife Carolyn, and her sister Lauren. We saw John at his worst possible point in his life to becoming the man that we all dreamed his father was going to be had he lived. And Carolyn was her own woman. We were robbed of a magnificent future, of a beautiful story. It's just the worst feeling. With the waters off Cape Cod becoming his final resting place, John Kennedy Jr. echoed the words of his father. We are tied to the ocean. And when we go back to the sea to sail or to watch it, we go back from whence we came. John knew you only get one run. He'd seen enough short lives in his short life. So I think he wanted to celebrate everything that he wanted to do while he could. Um, it changed my life in a way that I never thought was possible and uh, just made me tonight the happiest man alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a shame it was with all this love that they never had the time together to sort of feather their own nest. I now ask you to join your right hand and declare your consent before God and his church. What I miss about Carolyn is her kindness, her openness, and her friendship. She was just a person that you, when you sat and talked to, she made you feel like you were the most important person in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it's been 20 years, they're there, but I can't see them. And that's, that's how I feel. I mean, yeah, John was a very famous person out in the world out there. <laughs> but inside, I just knew him for who he really was. And I loved him for who he really was and my children and my husband and my mother. We all just loved him for who he was. You know, nothing we're gonna do is gonna bring them back. All right, there, yeah. But I would like for the memory to be positive. You know, the whole idea of lighting candles instead of cursing darkness. There's a more profound message in this video that shows their best day together. Here, here. Oh. How fun it was, how great it was. There's something greater going on here, and it's love. Oh.